All right, you guys, and good morning, and welcome to Taking Flight with me. My name is Mike Rocket Blackstone. Back with you here from the studio, and uh, just wanted to get going this morning with a, a little reflection on uh, the current status of the world, and to kind of take a, as my dad would say, a deep seat and a long look. Um, you know, there's a new heightened sense of uncertainty in the world, and uh, in these kind of times, I think the best thing to do is to do like my dad said and take that take that step back and just uh, kind of look at things from a, a little bit bigger perspective, from a much higher altitude and uh, and a much more calm viewpoint. And uh, the deep seat and the long look came from a time uh, in, the, in a flight simulator back in the day when I was training to learn to fly in a Saab 340 simulator and flight safety in New York. And... I was explaining to my dad how the, uh, you know, just things are happening so fast and, you know, you, you know, all the emergencies are coming and the alarm bells are going off. And, and uh, the instructor told me, he says, you know, when the alarm bells go off, take a deep seat and a long look. First, to evaluate what the problem is, state the problem, cancel the caution. And then this way you don't do something rash, uh, something like, cancel the caution, and now you're not sure what the problem is. So um, so right now, in that kind of an environment, in the heat of battle, in a, in a flight simulator with an engine on fire at low, low to the ground, it, it can sense a time for panic. And this is kind of one of those times, isn't it? You know, with, uh, with the, the Chinese spy balloon that was shot down over South Carolina coastline, and then the three other objects, now we're up to four. I, I know it, it kind of gets to be overwhelming. And, you know, we just kind of got to look at things from a little bit broader perspective. And, you know, this is, this is a test of, of our uh, understanding of the situation of, you know, what would we do if we were in China's position? Um, sometimes that's a good place to, to look from is, are they doing nothing more than what we would do if we were in their shoes? So maybe this is a sign of, you know, a Chinese panic situation. Are they worried that we're doing so much better than they are? And maybe they're not. Uh, we don't really know. So I think, you know, it's kind of good to, at these kind of times to, uh, to take a look at maybe from the other perspective and to kind of wonder, you know, are they feeling strong right now or are they feeling actually weak? So we're, we're doing appropriate analysis and response of the threat, but at the same time, we got to look at the at the reason and the real reason why someone is doing something on the other side of the planet. I did a little research this morning, and I found on New York Times a, uh, a an awesome article called "A Brief History of Spying with Balloons," and it goes on to describe when we began using balloons, of course, and their functional use in warfare over the last. I mean, the, the balloon was invented in like 1700. So the hot air balloon has been part of, of aviation for many, many, uh, you know, a long time, hundreds of years. So, but the problem with them is, is that they are uncontrollable mostly. So we felt them inferior. But you got to take a look at this from China's perspective right now is taking a look at old technology and then deploying it in with new technology. So, um, I'm, I'm actually really impressed with it. I think it's a, it's a hats off to China for an incredible in, uh, innovation to use old technology and combine it with new technology and to steer a balloon that normally would be unsteerable and go to, go to really high altitudes so it gets all of the benefit of cheap, efficient, um, slow moving you know like wow what's the benefit of slow moving and high altitude so at from a spy surveillance standpoint this is a brilliant uh a brilliant move not that that you know i'm pro china or anything but it, it is a touche wow it's it's a technological innovation to get a balloon up to high altitude be able to control it remote control it like our drones like our teslas uh autopilot self-contained battery technology, solar technologies involved, listening technology, recording technology, transmission technology, and I'm sure photographic technology and the ability to maneuver this thing at low, low speed at high altitude is, is incredible. They most likely felt kind of invincible there and in that they weren't going to get caught. Um, 
if they would have maintained control of that thing, kept it out of sight, I'm sure it would have it would done more, uh, more spying and more damage. So, um, from that perspective, as an aviator, as as a as a fighter uh, fan and a fighter pilot and a uh, someone who loves military aviation and uh, commercial and general aviation as well, I'm an aviation fan. I don't claim to be a historian by any stretch of the imagination, but as I look back on the history of aviation. The primary focus of aviation is to control the skies. And, you know, even in the days of the Wright brothers, no one really had a value for aviation back in those days. You know, they're like, balloon, yeah, I can't really control it. It's great to go up and see the other side. We can see the other positions. Now, from a higher posi- standpoint, we can look down on the, the bad guys and, 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 and find hidden treasures of, of where the where the weapons are, where the troops are, where the where the equipment is, and so on. So from a standpoint of, yes, we want to get higher, but if you can't control it, if you can't steer it, and you launch your balloon in the morning, it ends up captured by the uh, the enemy forces at the end of the day. It's it's not super useful as a uh, as a as a spy machine. But once you're able to control it, that's when the avi- aviation, that's when the airplane rather became so useful in warfare is now we can fly over the battlefield we can see where the other troops are we can call in the artillery shots and be more accurate with our with our deployment of our shells and then they realized hey you know from altitude we could drop bombs from the biplane and just reach out the side and drop a bomb onto our opponent's artillery positions and knock those out too so so it became pretty quick quickly known that aviation and control of the skies meant you controlled the battlefield and there became a race to air superiority who could get higher faster equipment better armed equipment into the sky to control the battlefield if you control the skies you control the the ground and that is a true statement today as as ever that led to a race for high-speed aircraft and into space and into you know the Star Wars program that we have the ICBM nuclear deployment of of weapons that go high and fast and the ability to target items target target um, targets from from high altitude and put put bombs on target from from space really using GPS is incredible technology to take that back to the beginning is, you know, the balloon. Like, you know, so yeah, you could launch a spacecraft and get your satellite up there, but now you're looking down at the Earth from 150 miles at 17,000 miles an hour, and that's kind of a tough, a tough way to look at the world from that distance. Let's go back to the basics. Chinese, the Chinese redeployed these these weapons, these balloons, really. Beautifully, I mean, it, it, you have to you have to give them give them credit where credit is due, and be able to steer it and stay at a low enough altitude to actually see stuff and hear stuff, and maneuver it. It's uh, it's very threatening, and this gives us a, a renewed sense of vulnerability, which is another article that the New York Times published, I believe, this morning. Uh, I'll, I'll show you here in a, in a couple of minutes. But basically, America's used to being the top dog, and we're used to to being. Uh, head of all technology, and this is a little bit of a uh, an embarrassment that, that old technology has been reinvented and is being effectively used against us, and we've kind of been caught uh, not looking for something like this. So then you deploy an F-22 to go look at a balloon, and you think, well, that's great. I can go check this thing out. It's moving slow. I can get to it. Yeah, you can, but you can't really fly at 50 knots in a F-22, in, in jet aircraft, anything below 100, 150 knots is kind of too slow. It won't fly much slower than 100, 150 knots. And in many cases, you know, not less than 200 knots. So um, it's tough to take a look at something when you're blasting by it at 200 plus knots. And it's also ho- hard to, uh, to shoot it down. So, you know, when you got something stopped in the sky, that's kind of scary. You know, when, you, when you're moving fast and you put your nose on something, you're on a collision course with it, and when you get within a gun parameter, you know, like in, in our case, when I, when I shoot the guns, simulated guns on our, on our fighter planes that we fly, um, 
we're between 500 and 1,000 feet. If you waited until you're 500 feet from a balloon before you opened fire on it with real bullets, you would likely fly into a debris field, and there's a very likely chance you just fly right into it um, and damage your own aircraft or take your own airplane down. So it's a very effective um, platform, and that makes America very concerned. And, and we need to just kind of look at it from the other side, the other perspective sometimes, and say, hey, you know what? Are they doing anything that we wouldn't do if we were in their shoes? And I think the answer would probably be yes. So we need to uh, also look at our own military capabilities. Should we be reinventing ourselves as well? Uh, I'm sure we are as we speak. I'm sure we're, we're upgrading our surveillance capabilities, our radar capabilities, our detection capabilities, and our weaponry to now defeat this this new threat. And I hope everyone takes that deep seat and a long look and takes a step back and, and, and a deep breath and say, man, I, I, I don't think we need to escalate this any farther. Let's just uh, put credit where credit is due, take appropriate actions to stop it and de-escalate the situation as soon as possible. So let's let's take take a look at the article real quick here just so you can kind of see what uh, what uh, might be some good reading for you today. And here we have um, brief history with spy balloons. Scrolling down here. Uh, it's interesting that both sides deployed them uh, during the Civil War. And that was 1860. We had a, a pretty robust balloon program. Balloons were operated in World War I by early adopters of the parachute. Hydrogen-filled balloons were crucial during World War I, and they were a, a prized target of the enemy because they were very valuable, and we certainly didn't want anybody watching us from the balloons to help guide in artillery fire. Scrolling down farther, Japan sent 9,000 balloons with bombs over the United States in World War II. I didn't know that. Um, that's interesting. Interesting read there. Tough to, tough to deploy balloons and get them to go where you want them to go. And, you know, China is on the opposite side of the planet, and they are upwind. So when they launch a balloon, it, it blows towards us. If we were to try the opposite method from, from America, launching a balloon from, from the United States, it's going to go east. And it has to fly all the way across the, the Atlantic and then maybe up over Europe and then through Russia. It's a long way around from here. So you can see why maybe from, from our perspective, it, it doesn't work as well as it does from, from China. And you can see... Uh, how effective that is for them to, to deploy that style weapon from the west side of the, at, of the Pacific. Scrolling down further, in this century, surveillance balloons were equipped with video cameras and sensors. And that was um, Afghan, the Afghan war. First used in Iraq during 2000, in, in 2004. So we're, this isn't new to us. We've certainly done this as well and have been successful with it. Now, whether or not we fly them around the world or not, all the way uh, across the planet to China is, uh, remains to be seen. And you know, if, we, if we are able to do it, it might be a secret program as well. In another article that I located here, February 10th, 2023, why Americans are so unsettled by the Chinese spy balloon. This article talks about World War II and how we were attacked by the Japanese and how unsettling it is to have a, an opponent, your, your enemy, sneaking up on you, finding your positions, and then attacking you from the air. Um, so... This Chinese spy balloon, it's a, it's a great article if you kind of go down here. This Chinese spy balloon really uh, kind of hits home to, to the vulnerabilities of human, the human being from the air, you know. And I think that it'd be great if, if all of the countries could kind of could recognize that, hey, you know what, we all can end the world at any time. Let's sit back. Let's not do that. Let's respect each other. Let's find common ground, and let's uh, let's use the ability to go into high altitude to improve 
the human condition, not to destroy it. What do you guys think? If uh, this sounds like something you're interested in, uh, please put uh, comments down below. So hit the subscribe button if you're interested in hearing more. And um, I thank you for getting to the end of this video. All right, so that's what I have for you guys today. And you've been watching Taking Flight with me. My name is Mike Rocket Blackstone. I'm going to go flying today. I'm wearing my flight suit. I'm, out, I'm always out flying something. So I'm going to go fly the jet today, go out and pull some Gs. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. Have a great day.